I'm going to be providing some uh, guided exploration with the Parflow integrated hydrologic model. I'm going to give you a quick, really brief background on what we're calling the Parflow project. There are a lot of uh, developers now. Um, I'll talk in a little bit more detail, but this really represents a community open source hydrologic model. Um, and the motivation for this, which I think is really important because I think if everybody thinks about what they want to use in their research, it's not about the tool, it's about the research questions and it's about where you're going to go with, um, with the particular experiments that you're going to run. And I think this is very important to keep in mind. So the idea behind the Parflow project is improve representations of terrestrial hydrolo hydrology, even moving towards the global scale. Of course, Martin's paper from the WR special issue in 2015 talks about this critical need to represent these hydrologic processes explicitly and mechanistically, not empirically. And so the idea behind the Parflow project, the idea behind the short course, the idea behind um, this thread of, of approaches and tools to help you in your research is really to get at these um, mechanistic understanding type questions. So what is the Parflow model? We have, it's a physically based integrated surface subsurface model. I'll talk about, if you're curious as to what's the difference between integrated and coupled, I'm happy to discuss that. We solve 3D variably saturated flow. We have fully integrated overland flow and fully parallel, parallel from the ground up um, implementation. And so we can look sort of at this depiction of the flow system and all of the processes that are represented here, kind of classical like the, um, the uh, freeze blueprint paper. Um, mathematically, we solve the mixed form of Virch's equation. We have a novel way that we combine in the Neumann type boundary condition, the shallow water equations. Um, and then we have the rest of the system that, that closes these equations. Now, what's really important about Parflow is that we have coupled in a huge number of other capabilities. And when I say capabilities, you really have to think about this pretty broadly because um, we have our own land surface model, which when you download Parflow, you get a full land energy, snow hydrology um, type system. But Parflow itself has been coupled into many other systems, including now currently into Wharf Hydro, um, for application at the National Water Model. So we have CLM, which we'll talk about a lot in the short course, um, Terras SMP, which is coupled in a different way. So we have a lot of flexible object-oriented capabilities in this. We've coupled into WARF. We've coupled with CrunchFlow. Um, so there's really a whole broad range of ways that Parflow fits into this larger community. And this is important because this you know, provides a lot more capability where the engine of Parflow is just this flow solver. So Parflow is parallel from the ground up. We use um, a newton kreloff nonlinear approach, which is the Kinsol solver. This is globally implicit, which means integrated. So we solve the surface and subsurface equations completely in a globally implicit uh, fashion. We use a multi-grid preconditioner for the linear solver um, using the hyper package and physics-based preconditioning. So what does all this mean? I can talk about this more. This means that we're using about the best solver techniques in parallel that exist to not only guarantee that we solve the nonlinearities of these equations together, whether or not they're the correct equations, that's, a, that's another story, but we at least solve these equations implicitly. Um, and for this really incredibly complicated nonlinear problem, we're using the best solver techniques that we have. We've scaled, we say, laptop to supercomputer. Um, this is Jose Fonseca's paper that just came out um, in, in computational geosciences, where he scales to all of the um, now just decommissioned Euclidean supercomputer. That's actually just under 500,000 MPI processors. Um, and it's 10 billion unknowns. Well, the whole point behind not just to, you know, solve the biggest problem possible, but to make sure that we have really good mathematics behind what we solve, but also to reinforce that it's the exact same code, exact same input files, exact same everything, laptop to supercomputer. So if you want to develop and scope a hill slope, it's the same code, the same inputs, all the way out to what's being run on the supercomputer. 
we have a rich publication history, and we have a web page, which I think was sent out, um, and more than 200 users. It's a research code, so it's heavily, um, heavily research-oriented. There's about 10 developers from academia and national labs. Range of priorities, of course, we have its community, so we use best development practices. And so if we think about the Parflow domains that have been, um, and this is one of the last things I want to leave you with, we think about the Parflow domains, we have sort of this worldwide approach, and really some of these domains are incredibly small, high resolution. Some of these domains are coarser resolution, um, but continental scale. And so we really try to use the same physics to bridge these scales. Um, we have a software productivity plan, everything's on GitHub. Um, we have a whole series of active branches in development. Um, we can walk through how to pull it. I've also, I have a copy of the GitHub um, repo with me, so we can just distribute it if you want, but if, if the internet's slow, we can also pull from GitHub. We have automated tests um, and a full suite of regression tests that are in a Travis CL, so they're constantly, um, sorry, Travis CI, that are constantly um, doing um, regression tests. So we're using a lot of these sort of standard approaches. So what I'm going to talk about in the short course is a mini version of um, and provide you with the materials for a number of short courses that we've done. There's been a lot of training and outreach. Most recently, um, we've done a number of short courses with Kwasi um, in the US. And we have a range of resources sort of from everybody that's like what's a command prompt to people that are uh, much more experienced. And so I have a whole series of tutorials that we can walk through. And in sort of the first meeting, um, I want to see who's interested and then see what your backgrounds are. And we can kind of walk through these things. Um, and we have a number of um, materials. I'm going to start with some simple stuff that we can work through. And then you can work on independently um, and then check in throughout the week. So then just to show some cool pictures, this is our CONUS 2.0 domain. Um, but then as we zoom in, we have Central Valley domain, we have East River domain, this is the EU Cortex domain, um, this is courtesy of Stefan Collette's group, um, particularly Jessica Koina, um, who's the PhD student who did this work. But then as you zoom in, they have all the way down to the Wistabach catchment, which is a very small, um, heavily instrumented catchment. And then now um, the group in Grenoble um, is has a Kanwa, West Africa, continental West Africa domain. And then we zoom in to the Amaketch sites where we have very detailed um, sites as well. And so really the idea is that we're trying to bridge these scales. So with that, thank you for your attention to this advertisement. And um, let me know if you're interested. And so in Table 1.1 and Parflow Manual, we have all of these different studies set up. And we say, OK, are they coupled? What's the scale? What things do they use? Do they use turning bands for subsurface? Do they use terrain following grid? Do they variably saturated? Do they use variable DC? All these different features. And then here's the citation and here's the paper you can read. And so you might say, well, you know what I'm going to do? Um, it's a good example. I'm going to look at just hill slope simulations with Parfil CLM. And so you could go grab Jen's paper, read her paper, see her hill slope setup, walk through, okay, I know exactly what components. And then to a large extent, and what we're doing with this um, with this short course is we have the little wash day examples, we have just as one of the test cases, just run a little wash for a couple days. Then the input script is annotated. The examples are all there. Forcing every single piece of that is there, documented in the manual. And there's a lot of different ways, plus all the papers are published. So there's a lot of different ways to sort of sit through the information and see ways to learn. So I think that's important because I think as we walk through the rest of this, um, we can walk through some of the different examples. We can walk through some of the different pieces. But there's the same information repeated many different times. And so you might just grab stuff from the Parflow blog. 
Some of what's in the Parflow blog is also in um, the materials I'm going to give you. Some of what's in the Parflow blog is also on the GitHub site. There's a lot. Some of this is also searchable in the user list. So there's a lot of different ways and a lot of different sources for the information. Okay. So I'm going to break here. Actually, no, I'm going to one super funny example. This is a good example to end on. So Freeze in Harlan, 1969. This was the state of the art computer in 1969. It was a Cray 7600. 10 megaflops, which I'll give you some context for, but that's a million floating operations per second. It was actually pretty unstable. It, um, they did make a lot of them, and uh, they would crash really easily. This was, of course, quite a bit before I was born. Um, IBM BGQ, this is Uqueen, where we did a lot of our work, at least in 2012. This is a five petaflop machine. This is a 10 megaflop machine. So to put this in context, I still have this Apple iPad 1. I'm not still using it, but I still have it. It was a 40 megaflop machine. How many of you have still have an old iPad or anything like that? Would you even consider it like fast enough to be usable? Probably not. It was still four times faster than the fastest supercomputer that Friesen Harlan had at their disposal. An Apple iPad Air is one gigaflop. Any recent iPhone, probably the same for Android too, is in the multiple gigaflop range, right? Orders of magnitude difference here, also orders of magnitude difference here. And so the thing that is really interesting is that Friesen Harlan envisioned this whole integrated model, per se, but it's taken a lot of advances, but one of the things is that they didn't even really have the computers to run on. They, when they thought this up, when they sort of conceived this. And so we can distribute the paper and such, but I think as we think through it, it's important to think about like, you know, what that might look like looking forward, what you might say in terms of this um, type of approach now. 